Hi everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Risk with Dr. Naveen Agarwal, where each week we talk about a topic related to risk management of medical devices. I'm your host, Naveen Agarwal, principal and founder at Achieve, where my personal mission is to help you achieve success in risk management. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Alicia Patel, who is a dental surgeon and now transitioning into life sciences management consulting. We talked about a doctor's view on risk and how they communicate the risk of different options to their patients in a way that is easily understandable. They take into account the natural anxiety a patient feels in these environments and they help their patients make the right decisions. We also talked about several emerging topics relevant for the medical device industry, such as using a patient-centric approach in generating data and evidence for safety and effectiveness, clinical trials, digitization, real-world data, and real-world evidence. So there's a lot packed in here. This was a conversation in front of a live audience as part of our weekly LinkedIn audio event. You're about to hear a recording of our conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So Alicia, I want to welcome you Thanks for attending our session today, and I, I'm so excited to be talking to you about your experience in the in the clinical environment. Thanks, Naveen. It's great to have the opportunity to discuss different topics um, in pharma with you today. Perfect. So, uh, Alicia, you are based out of UK. Can you uh, um, talk a little bit about your personal career journey, what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. So I'm from London. Um, I qualified as a dentist at King's College London in Guy's Hospital, uh, which is in London Bridge. Um, and uh, I studied biomedical science and then dentistry. And I have a kind of scientific and clinical background. So I worked for the NHS, which is our health healthcare service here in the UK. Um, and I worked for the NHS and private practice as a dentist. And then I moved into life sciences consulting, working in the pharmaceutical industry. So um, I'm able to kind of bring that patient centric approach to the work that I'm doing at the moment. Um, so a lot of my projects have spanned across medical affairs, market access, commercialization um, and clinical operations. So our projects support global pharmaceutical company clients like GSK, Pfizer, with a focus on um, process improvement change management and kind of streamlining that service development through you through using kind of functional strategies so uh, at, at the moment i'm moving to a new firm and the work that we'll be doing will focus on medical evidence practice in particular kind of strategy or life sciences for different assets along the life cycle fantastic now you are a dental surgeon or you have been a dental surgeon right so you have uh, done work with patients and Tell us a little bit about what it is like to be working with patients and what kind of, um, you know, questions you hear from them. And yeah, sure. how, just, just some examples of that would be very interesting. Sure. Excuse so me. I've worked with patients at um, a number of different hospitals. I know a lot of you are from the U.S. So uh, there are hospitals like Guy's Hospital, King's Hospital, and then we've got St. Thomas's in Waterloo. Um, and then also in practice. So we have dental practices here. Um, where, I've, where I've treated patients through NHS care work or and also private private treatments. Um, so uh, it's it's been quite varied in terms of the work that I've been doing. So with a focus on periodontology, which is treatment of the gums, orthodontics, so that's alignment of the teeth, um, caries, which is decay. And I, I've treated children, geriatric patients, and uh, patients with kind of severe learning disabilities and then also the general general public so that's just general dentistry as well um so working across hospitals and then practice work fantastic and what kind of uh, now we talk mostly about medical devices right so can you give a few yeah. examples of medical devices that you have used in your practice yeah of course so uh for example when we're administering anesthetic to patients we're using a syringe so you've got new syringes coming out all of the time. So I guess that's a kind of an example of a medical device. Additionally, if I'm doing root canal treatment, which is uh, known as endodontics, um, it's basically when you clean the root of the tooth out, when the tooth's infected, we, we're using a lot of different um, devices here. So uh, I guess certain risks could be, for example, choking on some of the instruments that we could be using in the mouth because it's such a small surface area that we're working in. 
that's a risk. So we have to use something called a rubber dam to kind of isolate the area. Mm-hmm. And isolate isolation is a key point, key learning topic that we studied at that I studied at dental school. Um, and it's all to do with safety and risk management. So when I'm speaking to patients about the treatments that they need, it's, it's important for me to really go into some depth about the risks and the benefits of the treatment. So, for example, with root canal treatment, one of the risks would be um, choking hazard on some of the instruments that we're using, as well as obviously the risks associated with the procedure itself. So infection, tooth loss, um, further gum disease and things like this. So there's, all, there's always risks that come with using these different um, devices that we're using for all of the, all of the procedures that we carry out. Yeah. So, uh, and also, you know, I know visiting a dentist office, I remember there's x-ray imaging equipment, there's a uh, lot of different equipment. And I'm sure, uh, you know, in your practice also, you have used a lot of other devices. And as you were mentioning about the about the risks, so what is of interesting interest to me is how you have that conversation with your patients and what kind of questions they ask you or you think it's necessary for them to understand before the procedure begins. Sure. So I'll first kind of go through, have a strategy to the treatment plan. And so the treatment plan needs to follow their individual kind of lives. So you have to take into consideration the social determinants of their health. So they may be, they may have a busy work schedule, which may influence their ability to attend for different treatments. Um, so they might need a longer uh, treatment plan. Um, so, all, so all these different factors kind of come into play when I'm explaining the treatment plan for the patient. Um, so I'll go in and start with kind of prevention. So general preventative methods that they need to take. Um, the kind of general course of treatment, the main treatments that they may need. So that could be an extraction. It could be clean uh, periodontal treatment. So that's treatment of their gums, um, cleaning beneath the gums of the, the teeth, um, which will involve administration of anesthetic. And there's obviously always a risk that comes with anesthetic, for example, prolonged numbing, um, needle stick injury. And then uh, if they need something more extensive, like root canal treatment um, and all the risks that come with root canal treatment, as well as extraction. So, um, for example, with extraction, we're using a, a lot of different medical devices here. Um, things like uh, pliers, dental pliers, um, forceps. Um, we use it. We have to take patients' blood pressure before extractions and also before root canal treatment, especially if they suffer from high blood pressure, it's important that we check the blood pressure at least three times. So we're using blood pressure monitors here. Um, We need to have, we need to sometimes check their insulin levels. So we'll ask them to do an insulin stick test if they've got diabetes, Um, like a glucose monitoring test. And uh, we'll often have to monitor their symptoms as we go. So constantly asking them uh, for, often patients will sometimes have a lot of anxiety regarding these treatments because we're doing treatments in the mouth. It's so um, kind of, it's, it's they're all invasive procedures. Um, so it's really important that I communicate to the patients all of the risks of using these different dental devices and also in particular, the, the risks that come with each of the procedures. So, um, and ensure that they understand all of these risks and benefits by asking them, do you understand? Do you want to explain that back to me? Um, in your own words, or do you have any questions that you'd like me to answer? Uh-huh. Oh, so that must be an you know an interesting conversation for you as a doctor because you want to make sure that the patient is relaxed, they understand what is going on, but you also want to finish the procedure quickly. So how exactly, how, how yeah. do you balance balance that need for you know informing the patient in a suitable uh-huh. way, but also completing the procedure quickly? How do you do that? Uh-huh. So I think it could just comes with practice. So the more kind of procedures you carry out, so the more root canal treatments you do, the, the quicker you get, the more efficient you get. And every patient will have their own individual problem. So it may be a problem that you hadn't foreseen at the beginning of treatment when you're uh, carrying out the examination. It may be something that you come across during treatment. Uh-huh. And then you need to be adaptable. So you need to kind of adapt to the situation as you go. And also, I think a big part of treating patients is learning to deal with patient anxiety, because especially with dentistry, and any medical procedure, any medical or dental procedure, uh, you, uh, any anything to do with the body, patients are a lot more, a lot of patients can feel quite anxious. <laughs> um, so it's being able to deal with their anxiety and to reassure them, explain everything, ask them if they have any questions. And I think ease of communication is particularly important with dentistry because 
of the anxiety that patients feel. You know, a lot of patients don't want to be there in the first place, unless it's, for example, for aesthetic treatment like whitening, Invisalign. If it's for something that they actually need, like, for example, a filling, root canal, extraction, nobody wants to really have that, those things done. So being able to uh, meet their expectations and to let them know kind of the limits of the treatment. And then maybe a lot of times if a patient's particularly anxious, I'll have to refer them to hospital. Uh -huh. uh, when I was working as a dentist, I'd have to refer them to the hospital for um, specialist treatment where they might need IV sedation. Uh -huh. um, and in that case, there'll be there'll be a lot of medical devices that the specialist specialist dentists will be using there. Yes. So this is fascinating, guys. I think it's a good start to our conversation today. And um, I want to really open the floor for discussion and Q&A. Uh, so, Pichan, you are requesting to speak. So here you go. Let me bring you on the stage. And guys, uh, rest of you also, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. It takes me a while to bring you on stage. So, um, you know, you just want to have a good conversation. Here's been, we have an opportunity with... Uh, Alicia, to talk about the real world experience in a clinical setting. So uh, while we wait for Bijan to join us, let me try to see if I can bring him again. It takes a while. It takes a while to get everybody uh, on stage to speak. Uh, but while we, have, while we wait for that, um, Alicia, can you think of uh, a situation or a scenario that sticks out in, in your mind through your experience where, you know, you were personally worried about uh, some of the risks related to devices or the procedure yeah. and you had to really think hard about mm -hmm. you know how to convince yourself first that mm -hmm. the risk was worth taking and yeah. how to get your patient kind of comfortable with that could you think of like some story or some scenario that um, you know we can get a sense of how it works in a clinical setting yeah, of course. So um, when I was training um, back when I was in dental school, we would carry out a lot of extractions um, under the supervision of more experienced clinicians. And I was working in King's Hospital, which is in uh, South London. Um, and a lot it's more of a deprived area. So a, a lot of the patients suffer from more dental anxiety there and they have a lot, a lot more teeth that need to be extracted. And sometimes these are the harder ones, you know, like your molar teeth at the back or your wisdom teeth. Mm -hmm. Um so if I'm explaining to the patient that this teeth, this tooth needs to come out, a lot of the time, the, sometimes, you know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of defensiveness from the patient, um, but it's really important to remain calm and patient and explain the risks of not having the extraction versus having the extraction. Mm. Um, so there was one patient I had in particular, I do remember the case, she, need, she needed four teeth out and you can only really take three teeth out at a time because of the bleeding risk. So I, I had to kind of advise her, regarding her smoking habits um about the extent of the damage that had been done uh, because smoking can severely affect uh your teeth and it can lead to gum disease and tooth mobility um, which which will eventually lead to tooth loss um so i had to advise her about ways to prevent this from happening further and she initially didn't want to have any of the teeth out and i did have to advise her about the risk of sepsis in the future and obviously sepsis is a dangerous infection but yeah you know the, the lat i think sometimes patients don't realize the extent of how severe um tooth pain can be and the kind of severity in terms of what it can lead to um if you, if it's not treated at the right time and if it's all about kind of balancing the benefits versus the risks yeah, that's that's fascinating because imagine somebody is now faced with this question of four of their teeth, three or four of their teeth being removed. Yeah. Uh, the, the mental image of that itself is painful. And you have exactly. to kind of yeah. empathize with the patient and explain to them, uh, you know, the risk of not doing something or the risk of doing something. And that's that could be pretty interesting conversation, I can imagine. Definitely. And sometimes it can be more extensive than you planned for. So it can also impact the next patients that you have. So you don't want to delay your treatment for the next patient. So it's, it's about managing your time yeah. as well as managing the patient's expectations. Yeah. So folks, those of you who are joining uh, right now, uh, we are having this very interesting conversation uh, and really try to understand what happens in a clinical setting between a doctor and a patient. Uh, what kind of things are top of mind? for the doctor as well as for the patient. And we do, you know, we are engineers and quality and regulatory people. We work a lot with design and development and, um, you know, in, in the manufacturing 
environment, but we don't get to experience the patient doctor sort of experience. And that's the reason I was excited. I'm excited about this conversation with Alicia. So um, uh, let's, let's, you know, share what we have in mind. I'm, I invite you to um, come and join us on the virtual stage. I'm trying to get Bijan and I'm having difficulty. So Bijan, you may have to kind of uh, try again a little bit in a little bit, but um, everybody else, please, uh, here you go, Mark. Um, let me see if this is going to work this time. Uh, so I guess uh, Bijan is asking me. Okay, so uh, Mark, let's see if, you, if we can get you on stage quickly and uh, let's continue our conversation in the meantime. So Alicia, uh, I know you are transitioning into a new role. Can you tell uh -huh. a little bit about what you're going to be doing and um, how your prior experience with, with the patient is actually going to be helpful? Sure. So I've been working in life sciences consulting now for around six months and I'm moving. I was at a startup firm and I'm now moving to a, a larger organization. So we have around 80,000 plus employees in this organization working across the US, the UK, South Asia and Africa, um, working for pharma companies on asset development across the life cycle. So the company is made up of kind of data scientists, clinicians, epidemiologists and consultants, um, and sometimes a mix of both. Um, so with a number of different teams and our clients are pharmaceutical companies like GSK and my team focuses on medical evidence practice, particularly oncology um, and strategy within the life sciences. So we're looking at things like integrated evidence generation, um, a move towards um, real world evidence and the value of real world evidence across the life cycle. So I'm sure that medical devices, in term, when you're looking at kind of evidence for uh, medical devices in terms of safety, efficacy, you're also looking at real world evidence as well. Yes. And in fact, uh, I know FDA, at least in the US, is uh, pretty receptive to using real world yeah. data and real world evidence in both pre-market and post-market regulatory decision making. So that's a good point. Yeah. Mark, you are on stage, so uh, I want to invite you to unmute your mic and share what we have, what you have in mind. Okay, well, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you both. It's an uh, interesting discussion. Um, I'm curious about, uh, Elisha, about if you've ever had to uh, really talk to a patient about clinical alternatives, you know, because most of the discussion seems to be focused on, on the risks. Yeah. Uh, and implicit in that is is really the benefits. So I'm I'm just really kind of curious if you've ever had situations where you've had um, clinical alternatives and there's risks and benefits to each, and what you did to kind of navigate that that dialogue. You know, specifically because uh, I would expect that uh, patients may not fully understand all the clinical risks or the clinical benefits. And so just curious how you would approach that or how you have approached that in the past. Yeah, of course. So um, a lot of the time, for example, let's take a more extensive treatment plan where a patient needs to have kind of two teeth removed, let's say, over something which is more simple, such as a filling or uh, braces. So a lot of the time, the if the teeth are kind of savable, I would advise for root canal treatment, but there's always the option for an extraction. Um, we, you tend to go for root canal treatment if you feel like you can hold on to the tooth for a few more years. Um, but then there's the whole, the whole risks of root canal treatment are quite extensive because root canal, it takes a number of different weeks to treat. Um, it involves a number of different appointments and it may not actually be successful in the long term. Whereas an extraction, uh, obviously you're going to lose the tooth, but the, the the positives of an extraction are you can have pain relief ultimately because you're, it removes the risk of infection unless you're carrying out things like smoking which we advise patients not to do after having an extraction so it's being able to balance the risks and the benefits when when i'm describing these different procedures but ultimately i will i would recommend what i would advise the patient to do so if i thought that the pa the tooth was worth hanging on to and that root canal treatment would be successful i would definitely communicate that to the patient um, whilst giving them the other alternative, which is an extraction. Interesting. This is fascinating because you are having to do this analysis very quickly also, right? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, it's also about kind of getting a feel for the patient. If they're anxious, mm -hmm. uh, root canal treatment is going to involve a lot of a number of different appointments. It's going to involve an extensive treatment plan. Whereas with an extraction, it's very quick. It's, you know, you, you give the anesthetic, you loosen the tooth, and an extraction can take about around 20 to 25 minutes. Whereas root canal treatment would take a number of different appointments, which can take hours. So for, for, for a root canal treatment, uh, one appointment could last two to three hours or, you know, one to two hours at best. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's considering the patient's time, their availability, you know, whether they're a full-time worker, and ultimately what, what the patient wants. So w w I wouldn't be able to carry out any treatment that even if I thought it was in the patient's best interest, if they hadn't given their consent. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Got it. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Mark, I hope that makes uh, sense for you. Um, but if you have other questions and comments, you know, please hang in there and, and share that. So I'm going to invite Jehaji now. Thanks for joining us, Jehaji. And please unmute your mic and share what you have in mind. Hi, Davin. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, the platform. This is uh, very educational. Um, my question for you, Alicia, was um, you mentioned there uh, uh, medical device comes with risk. Uh, for the new medical devices, where do you normally get the information that outlines uh, the risk that are, involved, that are inherent in the device? So normally, in terms of the risks for medical devices, we're given the devices in our surgeries. So they're already in the hospitals, they're already in the practice. So they're, we already know that they're suitable for use. It's looking at what the proceed, the actual procedure which involves the medical device, what the risks are for the procedure. So for example, for root, root, root surface debridement, which is cleaning underneath the tooth for people with extensive gum disease, we would advise them of sensitivity, um, recession, so those would be the risks. Um, we'd, I'd discuss with them the instruments that I'd use. So I would discuss with them the medical devices that I'd be using, which would be an ultrasonic scaler or a hand scaler. Um, and normally those don't come with specific known risks that w I would tell the patient. It's more about the procedure. So in terms of more extensive procedures like root canal treatment, um, maybe more specialist dentists might be carrying mm. out implantology, they would discuss the risks of the instruments that they're using. Okay, lovely. Uh, yeah, oh, I don't think my question was uh, the devices that you use in terms of risk that are associated with those devices. Is there any specific place where you get those uh, where the risks are outlined? So I might look to the FDA. I might look at nice guidelines. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that yeah. Comes, thanks very much. I guess the point here is that by the time the device reaches the doctor, it has already yeah. gone through the regulatory exactly. process and the yeah. acceptance process. So yeah. the doctor would expect that the benefit risk has already been evaluated and acceptable. Now, what I'm wondering, Alicia, is that okay. during the use of some of these devices, if you come across a surprise, let's say, hey, it's supposed to work this way, but uh, it's not working that way. And as a result, in your mind, then you begin to think that, uh, you know, the risks are pretty high with this device, even though it came to me through an like a formal approval process, right? So during yeah. use, and how does that information get back to, you know, let's say the hospital or the people who are making decisions? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I would always go back, I would write it in my notes, my clinical notes about the risks of the certain device. Um, I would choose to probably use an alternative device if I thought it was too risky for the patient. Um, uh -huh. We're doing the procedure there and then, so I would never take the risk if I thought that, you know, that that it was a dangerous device to use. But I would always commute, if I was worried about a certain device, I'd definitely communicate it to a senior. So that could be a resident consultant within the hospital team. If I'm working in practice, it might be the practice manager. Got it, got it. So, so I think for all of us, this is an interesting perspective that doctors expect the devices in their hands to work, period. They expect the devices yeah. to have a risk profile which is acceptable, no surprises. Exactly. And when surprises happen or they are concerned, they will bring it up to kind of their um, management or their authorities to proceed further, right? So from our True. side, we have to do our best to develop and build devices which are safe, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, def I definitely agree with that, Naveed, because as a HCP, you're already dealing with lo a long patient list, uh -huh. the COVID backlog of patients, you're 
um, dealing with patient anxiety. So you have all of these other factors that you need to think about when you're actually carrying out the procedure. So the last thing you want to be thinking about is what are the risks of me using this device? Like it should already be safe. Yes, you know? yes, you expect it to be safe. That's a very, exactly, very interesting yeah. view. Uh, Ravi Kant, you have joined us. So I want to welcome you. Please uh, share what you have in mind. Yeah, thanks, Naveen. Uh, I would like to share some information that I know with respect to the questions raised by Jehaji and your uh, recent one. Uh -huh. So, uh, if, but I, I think uh, Jehaji has asked about um, how how do you know risk about a new medical device? Uh, I th I think there's l there's a lot of depth in this question. Uh, but my any any manufacturer, those who develop a new device, they always have a good collaboration with uh, you know clinicians first. Uh -huh. They try to understand what are their requirements, and they develop based on that. And and there are a lot of extensive tests, as especially usability related tests, or how it can be used, how how what what are the risks with that, and they take constant feedback before the product is put into the market. So I, I think that is a place where a manufacturer has to engage more, collaborate with the hospitals or clinicians to get more feedback to address the risks, not only related to usability, but also safety related. Yeah, uh, and I, I think we would right. expect the regulatory process to require that and the data on safety and effectiveness to include kind of real world use, we would we'd expect that. Now, I think everybody does the best they can in design and development, but still we find a lot of surprises and incidents post-market. And I think that is where maybe more conversation with doctors could be useful about their actual experience so we can understand what went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I would also like to add up there, with respect to post-market uh, surveillance, uh, Dr. Alicia has talked about, uh, you know, if she found some something risky, she either reports to senior or other means. But it is also important how do how well the manufacturer has established that communication channel between hospitals, between field to back into the risk management of product. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I, that's also one important factor. Uh, you should have a have a forum or a, have a you know place where uh, uh, the clinicians can raise suggestions or report back uh, directly to the manufacturer in addition to what they generally report to the authorities. Absolutely. Yeah, I, agree. I think it's all coming, it's all kind of linking to real world evidence now. So, you know, the fact that we don't have to carry out huge clinical trials, we can use external comparators and com use those and compare them against single arm trials regarding the use of devices as well as assets. And that gives an idea, we can get our information from things like registries, databases, you know, national and regional registries. And that allows us to get that kind of information from hospitals. So it's hospital registries that we can look at mm -hmm. where we can get this kind of data and use that to inform our strategy going forward with improving any asset or any device um, for different therapy areas. Fantastic. What a, what an awesome conversation, guys. This is, this is really the key benefit of our casual conversations every Friday. And I really appreciate your participation and engagement in this. Uh, now, you know, I, I know we have only a few minutes left, so uh, I, I did have one more question to ask Alicia about this. Is, sure. Uh, and particularly say a little bit more about the real world data and evidence. I know this is going to be a very big deal in the future mm -hmm. because yeah. we want to innovate faster. We want to make safe and effective devices and we can yeah. do clinical trials in all situations. So can yeah. you say a little bit more about how you think this area is going to evolve? and what we in the industry should be kind of thinking about and learning more about. Definitely. So I think now that real world evidence, it's it's become a necessity for HTA submissions to regulators for assets. And I think as well for, me for medical devices, I think what's happening now is we need to look at things like registries in more detail. So national, regional registries, databases, pharmacies, so we can see kind of the distribution of sales for certain things, for certain assets. And we can look to looking at patient reported outcomes. So that will give us an idea um, of what patients, how patients are experiencing using different assets and devices. And that can inform our evidence plan going forward. As well as real world data, this data needs to be incorporated into an integrated evidence generation approach. So that's evidence which is taken from 
you know, using all different kinds of evidence generation modality. So that's registry, databases, traditional, tr traditional clinical trials, as well as things like synthetic control arms and external comparators, using all of that data and ensuring that all stakeholders needs are met. So patients, payers, regulators, HCPs, um, across different geographies. So Asia, Africa, Europe, um, and also trying to increase investment and budgeting for research that will drive these clinical trials and drive this integrated evidence generation approach. So now I think the focus should be on evidence platforms. So mm -hmm. ensuring that our real world evidence generation ensures that it's creating a value for patients in terms of the assets and devices that we are creating here. So. Um, I think one of the issues that real world evidence has at the moment is kind of quality compliance, governance mm -hmm. and data validity. So ensuring that we're selecting the correct data um, and with the data that we're selecting is reliable. So we, we can generate insights at a rapid pace, which is continuous, mm -hmm. but the data that we're using to drive these insights is reliable. So yeah. ensuring that we're finding data that's um, valid. Yeah. And I think uh, as far as, um you know, uh, engaging with regulatory authorities is concerned. That's always a good idea. I know in the in the uh -huh. U.S., FDA is very open to having uh -huh. a conversation with you as you plan your approach to using real world data to provide evidence of safety and effectiveness. So, all these yes. points that you are mentioning, Alicia, are very valuable point, and I think we're going to see a lot of movement in this direction. Ed, you uh -huh. have joined us on the stage, so I want to welcome you uh, as always. Please uh, let us know what you have in mind. Certainly, uh, Naveen, and this has been, uh, as everybody else has said, a very enlightening conversation. And I, I thank uh, Alicia for joining us this week. Um, I just uh, finished attending the MedCon conference in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, which is a, um, a collaboration between RAPS, uh, AFTO, and the FDA. And one of the things they uh, discussed there was a section on use of real-world evidence, including patient self-reporting. And um, the uh, FDA is working with uh, NEST, N-E-S-T, uh, and developing a uh, platform like we're talking about here. And uh, it was a very interesting session. Uh, we're going to have the, the slides and the links here. Uh, perhaps I can uh, post it when I get that information. That would be uh, fantastic, yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot going on there. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. I don't know whether there's any combination products people here or not, but uh, uh, this week um, the uh, Susan, uh, what's her? <laughs> Susan Needle. Uh, Susan Needle published uh, the Combination Products Handbook, which yes. has got a, um, I think it's a 70-page chapter on uh, risk management for combination products. Now, I have to disclose that I was one of the authors of that chapter, but um, that that book is uh, tremendous. I had an opportunity to review some of it. So if you're in combination products, this is one you should get your hands on. But anyway... Um, the, going back to the MedCon conference, um, it started with a uh, workshop on risk management, uh, which was an excellent uh, program. Um, and uh, uh, it was introduced by uh, Kim Troutman, uh, from, uh, formerly from the FDA and currently at uh, uh, Metacept. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that, was, that would be something you may want to put uh, on your agenda for the future. Uh, the MedCon conference, because they did uh, disclose things like um, ISO 1345 for uh, replacing the uh, current uh, medical device regulations uh, is moving along. Uh, it's currently uh, on the uh, FDA's website is being released in December. Uh, don't know if that's going to happen or not. They said it will be updated in June as to, to the date. But uh, uh, so there's there was a lot of good news there from that conference and uh, some tremendous tremendous sessions on AI and cybersecurity and a, a ton of other um, things and and risk management was just discussed throughout uh -huh. uh, and the FDA 
1345, that movement there, uh, they did discuss a lot about uh, the new emphasis that they're going to uh, place on risk management in the uh, uh, U.S. quality system. So um, risk was a, a, a constant theme uh, in the program. And I'll be quiet now. That's awesome, man. Thank you for sharing this. I'm so excited. Uh, that you were able to go to this conference and hear sharing with us. And guys, that's really the benefit of our conversation here, right? We get to hear such latest developments and uh, have interesting conversations. So as we close, Alicia, uh, I want to invite you to share any closing thoughts or comments you might have. Thanks, Naveen, and thanks, Edward, for sharing that. Um, I would say now the move is towards having a patient-centric approach regarding our medical devices and our assets mm -hmm. and looking to real world evidence um, to inform our evidence strategy regarding the development of these assets and these devices. So considering this from a regional and local perspective across Europe, Asia, Africa, um, all of these different locations and kind of ensuring that the evidence that we're generating is reliable. Mm -hmm. So noting the challenges that come with using this real world evidence and uh, ensuring we've got s enough evidence to meet all of the stakeholders' needs. So that's that can be planned for by having an early asset, early device strategy um, from the beginning of the asset. And this will obviously change as um, we, we build our evidence as the asset goes across each uh, phase of the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing where to look for when we're looking for real world evidence. So for example, with the synthetic control arm, looking to external comparators for uh, uh, to compare against when we're, when we're researching into a new asset or new device um, and unlocking the potential of evidence platforms through investment budgeting, PROs, building relations with registries and investing in biobanks, tissue infrastructure, uh, developing information governance. All of these key factors will play an important part, I think, for the future because we've already got the advancement of personalized medication, mm -hmm. genomics, um, RNA-based therapeutics from COVID. So all of this huge influx of data and information, we can use that to the advantage for patients and bringing as many innovative therapies as we can and uh, devices which patients can use to help. Um, we didn't t really touch on dig the digitalization of healthcare, but I think that it's, it's definitely um, a key feature of medical devices at the moment. And yeah. things like decentralized clinical trials, patients have got a lot of at-home wearable devices that they're using and they're using these in these clinical trials now. So ensuring that we, you know, patient centricity and the digitalization of health, uh, I think are, are very closely related at the moment. Yes, fantastic. So such exciting stuff going on in our industry, right? Yeah, And I, I think these are topics that we should explore in our future conversations. Uh -huh. So with that, I wanna thank you, Alicia, and thank, uh, thank you everybody, Mark, Ed, Chihaji, Ravi Khan, uh, all of you guys also j for joining us. Uh, this has been just great. I hope you are getting a lot of value out of these weekly conversations. Uh, reach out to me directly, one-on-one, -on -one, if you have ideas for future topics or if you want to participate. Uh, actually, next week, um, we are going to have a conversation, I believe, with Andy, who is here in the audience. And I'm not going to tell you the topic, but it's going to be very, very interesting. Now, one final thought for you is that in case you miss these discussions, First of all, we meet every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. But in case you miss them, I will be producing recording. And I have been doing that of our prior sessions. You can find those recordings on my newsletter. And you can access the newsletter through the first link in my featured section on the LinkedIn profile. So if you go to my LinkedIn profile, you will find the link to the newsletter. Subscribe to it. And you will be getting these recordings and key highlights that I write up after our conversation. So you can continue to uh, be engaged, participate, but if you miss, you will have that resource ready for you. With that, guys, thank you again for, for joining, and uh, I want to wish you guys a happy weekend ahead, and we will connect again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Alicia. Thank, thank you, Naveen. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.